Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guest is actually someone that I went to school with many moons ago. She is an incredible actress. She's currently on tour with 222, A Ghost Story, a play very close to my heart. She's also juggling that with a two-year-old. It's Louisa Lytton. Hello! Who's losing her mind? (laughs) I mean, it's a lot. I think that play alone is a lot. Like that emotional roller coaster that you go on as Jenny every night. That's, you know, it's 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 difficult to manage, I think. So intense. Obviously, you know, you also played Jenny. When I first read the script, I was like, this is just like reading me. I just felt like I was reading myself. So I was like, oh, this will be easy. Um, but what I didn't really understand or sort of take into consideration at the time was, you know, I'm not coming home every night. So I'm doing this show. For those of you that haven't seen it, it's about a, a couple who... Um, I don't really know what I can give away, but basically, it's an emotional roller coaster yeah. for Jenny, the role that I play, and it's all surrounding a baby who's nearly one, and all the emotions that come with having a baby. So obviously, me then being on tour and being away from her, it's been so tough. It's been so much harder than I thought. You know, you've you've yeah. toured now with three kids. Yeah, um, yeah. It's really hard. But with halfway and at the same time, I've absolutely loved it because I'm finally doing what I love again, you know. Yeah. And what a piece so to, just... be, to be doing as well. No, it's, it's, an, yeah. it's an incredible piece within itself. But, I mean, juggling that with motherhood isn't the easiest of things to do, plus being on tour. Have you managed to yeah. take her with you at all or not? Yeah, so we've been, every week is different. We are literally winging it. I've had yeah. so many people say to me, like, how are you doing this? And what's the setup? And I'm like, well, it changes week by week. Because yeah. obviously, you know, with having a two-year-old, before the job started, I put everything into place. You know, she was traveling on this day, on this train, at <laughs> this time. And obviously, if she gets ill or, you know, anything can happen. So at the moment, what we've done is week by week, it is it's sort of changing. So some weeks she's managed to come with me and my husband because he can work remotely, which is amazing. And then other weeks she's been at home and yeah. she's been, my mum's been helping out and I've just sort of been commuting, coming back and forth. Uh, and other weeks I just haven't seen her for sort of five days at a time and then I travel home for the days off. And it's so hard though, even if they are with you, because you know mine are slightly older now, they're at school, but being two... If she's with you on tour, you are literally full-time mummying the whole day. Not that I ever think anyone part I think you're a full-time mum no matter what you do, but you're doing all yeah. of that stuff in a day, then come six o'clock going to the theatre. And and there, yeah. there's no there's no switch off, there's no space, there's no let up. And it is such a I don't think I think with that show, I do feel like you have to kind of be able to switch off from it or kind of step away from it in in some way. And I think it's to go straight into you know, being up at yeah. six the next day and into that before going into another yeah, show. That's, that's what I found hard, I guess. And also the days that she's not with me, I'm still in, my brain still wakes me up at six o'clock in the morning. Do, yeah. So we're doing, we're really doing two shows a day. We're doing eight shows in five days. So we're doing, you know, a lot. And I'm doing, I finish at say 10 o'clock. I get back and I'm like, right, I'll go straight to bed. I'm wired from the show because you're, you know, you're still on an adrenaline rush. Yeah. So then I fall asleep maybe 12, one, and then I'm up at six because I, <laughs> I'm just so used to being up at six. So yeah. yeah, it's, 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 I mean, I sound like I'm moaning. I'm not. It's, you're not moaning. It's great. I'm so lucky to have the job. I guess I just feel like, Oh, two things, really. I feel like I've thrown myself into the deep end. Like, she's two, she's at a really, you know, that age is quite difficult anyway. And her whole life has just changed. Yeah. Before this job, I was at home all day, every day with her. Yeah. You know, I, I've worked, but a day here or a week there, nothing like this. Um, but also, I do feel like being on tour is the most difficult job we would ever have as an actor. Yeah. As in, you know, the so I've done it now. Yeah, I've done like the hardest bit, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, when yeah, because... she's older, I'll be able to explain it more. If there's a job that that I'm, if I'm filming, for example, I'll be in one place, yeah. so she can either be with me or be at home. Whereas at the moment, whenever she comes to visit mummy at work, I'm somewhere else. Yeah, so she doesn't really understand what 
Like, what are you doing, Mark? Well, no, so that in itself... <laughs> what is this job you have? <laughs> <laughs> but that in itself is really tricky because every, like, Tuesday, you're in a new place, you're in a new place to stay, call your home for a little while, and then you ha- you settle and you figure out where everything is, and then it's gear change, different place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember because I've toured loads before I was a mum and loved it because, yeah. you know, you you find your local coffee shop and just, you know, you just, <laughs> you know, just the fun things. Whereas um, this time around, I'm working out, like, if I've got good enough Wi-Fi so I can FaceTime her, if she's coming where the closest, like, soft lays, there's been so many times that I've planned a whole fun week for her and she comes and she just does, she just hates everything that we're doing because she's just <laughs> out of her routine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, touring is is... It is different. I, when I first got the job, there was a small part of me that was like, oh, I'm going to get a break. I'm going to get time away and be able to sit and read a book. I bought a book on week one. I still haven't opened it. Like no! It's just not what you think it's going to be. <laughs> no, I just ha- I don't know why. I just haven't had a second. Still, I haven't had a second. Even it's when weird, she's not isn't there. isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so let's talk about your childhood. Where did you grow up? Did you have siblings? What was it like? So I'm an only child. So I grew up in London. We lived on a an estate and I was there until I was about maybe, God, I don't even know. I think until I left home at, say, 18. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was just me. As you know, I, I went to a theatre school, which was crazy because um, nobody in my family had sort of ever been in the industry so it was a new world to everyone and what was your route into it were you like a dancer or were you just did you just love everything yeah I think I love dancing so I started ballet and tap and all classes like that at Italia Conti which was not far from my world we were living at the time yeah (laughs) Kelsey we talk about this the enemies I know we talk about it too because I know Kelsey obviously really well um so I started yeah dance classes as a kid that's that was my first love that's what I loved whether or not I'd ever be a professional dancer I don't know but I loved it and then uh, I don't really know how but at a certain age I guess I auditioned to go to Italia Conti or Sylvia Young like as a secondary school got into Sylvia's and and that was it and then I was in and then obviously I I got EastEnders when I was 15 years old. So I was sort of just thrown into the, thrown into this world at a, at a young age. Did you manage to juggle the EastEnders and Sylvia? So how, how did you do that? Because obviously you would have been on set a lot. Yeah, so Mr Mac, yeah. who was our English teacher, for those that don't oh, know, who is an absolute legend, who I spoke yeah. to the other day, by the way. We still speak. Oh, I love him we so still much. Speak. I don't think, I think all of us who are creative after Sylvia's and have gone into past, I think Mr. Mac is one of those teachers who definitely left a mark on all of us and he's a massive all of reason us. for what, yeah, all of what us. we're doing. He was incredible. He was a, he was an English teacher, but he would like jump on the tables and <laughs> he was crazy, wasn't he? Yeah. Anyway, so he was my men, not mentor, he was my, what's it called when they have to come to work? and Tutor. Teach you. You tutor. tutor. He was my tutor. No! He, so he would come onto the East End of set and do like classes with me. Yeah, you can imagine. Oh my gosh. Um, but basically I joined East Enders a few months before finishing school. So really I was there for GCSE time. Yeah. So I would just go back to school to do my GCSEs and that was it. So oh I pretty gosh. much left school a few months early. Yeah. And I would just go back to do my GCSEs, which was, yeah, I can't really remember it though. I feel like it must have been full on, but I don't really remember that yeah. time. Well, so I think things about that. like that were quite normalised at Sylvia's, I would say. Of course. Yeah, of course. I think to my family, like my mum and dad, they was like, well, what is going on? You know, you've got your exams to do. But yeah, you're right. At Sylvia's, it was, we were always working. So we were yeah. always in and out yeah. of school. But I loved it. I loved it so much. I always, and then that was it. I joined EastEnders at 15 and it's, that's it. It's gone on from there. I would say even though you're a, an only child, your group at Sylvia's are so tight-knit, like your girlfriends. Still to this day. Yeah. yeah. My best friends are from school. Yeah. All of my, well, most of my best friends are still from my year at school. Yeah. We're so that. close. You kind of grew up, grew up together. We did. And it's so funny because you look back now at times where we'd say, 
when we were leaving, please, can we stay in touch? And now we're, like, changing each other's babies' nappies. Like, it's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? You know, stay in touch. We basically live together. <laughs> That's so lovely. Yeah. Did you ever yeah. look to the future and think of yourself as a mum and having your own family? Always. I'd always, always wanted kids. I always said I wanted a big family because I was an only child. And I don't feel like I missed out growing up, but I think I just wanted what I, what my friends had, you know, yeah. siblings and big Christmases and all these sort of big events weren't that big for me. Mm. Um just me and my mum, dad and my grandparents, which was lovely. But, you know, I sort of, I, I definitely feel like I wanted a bigger family growing up. Um, and I always knew I wanted to be a mum. I never really, until I met Ben, was ever with the right person to have really? kids. Did you ever wonder like about it though? Because that's obviously a massive part of being the right person. But I think we're so channeled growing up that we're going to meet someone, we're going to get, get like whatever that is. And I feel like yeah. sometimes we, we zone in on people that are really wrong, but we're kind of yeah. like, actually, they're these steps that I've got to take to become a mum or... 100%. I, th- I was with someone for uh, off and on for about six years. It was not a great relationship, pull it that way, um, which we can kind of laugh about now. But, you know, yeah. at, at the time it was it was chaos. I don't think I ever really had the thought whilst being with him of having children. Mm. I knew I wanted kids, which is quite telling, isn't it? If I knew yeah. I wanted kids but probably didn't really want them with him, I don't know why I held on for so long, but we we do what we do. And then after <laughs> him, actually, was when I went into panic mode. And I remember thinking, because at that time I must have been about 26-ish, I can't remember. I can't remember. I've been with Ben now for nearly six years. Mm. I'm 34. We'll do the math. Um, <laughs> I remember panicking then, thinking, well, what now happens? Mm. And you know what? There was a part of me that I would have just, I would have found a way. I'd have had a child on my own because yeah. having a child for me was like the ultimate in life. That's not for everyone, but it just always was with me. Yeah. So then when I met Ben, I just remember thinking, oh, how lucky am I that I've met someone that I just want to have kids with. I just want every, just wanted everything there and then. Did you know? he? Did you talk about so, it with him straight away? Oh, I think probably on our first date. It was very, it was very open from the start. I remember we we literally went on a blind date, and by the end of the date, it was. It's so weird, isn't it? Because looking back, I'm like, wow, we must have been mad. But I wanted to know, like, he was from up north, and I wanted to know, do you want to move back there? Because I'm not going there. Um, do you want kids? Because I definitely do. I think we just. And it wasn't even in a way of like, oh, I want these things from you. It was just, I'm an adult now. I've been through a lot. This is what I want in life. Are you, yeah. are you game or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess it's good so early always, days to kind of filter the, not that other stuff. Let's yeah. not waste time. And then it was just fun. Exactly. Yeah. And then it was fun because we sort of got the awkward thing out the way of, you know, this might not work between us, but it, if if that's what you want in life, then great, because that's what I want too. It was never yeah. really about us to start with. And then, yeah, everything did then happen really quickly. And we've been together, yeah, six years. We're married. We have a child. She's two. Crazy. <laughs> when did crazy. that shift come, though, from kind of going, we're going to have a baby at some point, to kind of going, actually... Let's lock down. <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> Something to do. <laughs> Something to do. Um, it was because we were due to get married and the first lockdown happened. So then my wedding was like postponed by a year. And I remember at the time saying, if this goes on any longer, like I don't I don't want to wait. I'm 34 now. So I was 32 when we yeah, when, when I had her. I was just like, I don't really, I, I, it, I always wanted to get married first, but I mm. guess when you just are with someone and you just know, I was like, yeah. well, what difference is it going to make to our lives if we're married or not? Like, I'm in this forever with you. So, Well, um, weddings were such was, an uncertain it, thing at that point, weren't they? The rules were always changing. You got married abroad, yeah. didn't you? Did you get married abroad? In the end, yeah. So in the end, we yeah, all tri- that stuff. We ripped up the papers and was like, "Let's start again." <laughs> um, yeah, so that that's sort of where it come from. And I remember I was working at the time. I was in EastEnders at the time, and I thought, you know what? I'm so fortunate that I am working, mm. and at a time where many people were not. Yeah. So I knew that we had like that stability. Um, we had no idea what was happening with the wedding, so we kind of joked and was like, "Let's just see what happens." 
and it happened really quick. We were really? really? Yeah, we were so, so lucky. Like, first month quick. Um, <laughs> what were your <laughs> symptoms? And were you a bit like, surely not? Or were you like, oh, of course. <laughs> it was just before Christmas. And on Christmas Day, I had a tequila. And I went to bed and I was like, I'm going to run. And I'm not like, you know, I can, not that I can drink, but I would never really be sick. And I thought, there's no way this has happened that quickly. And that was my first symptom. And then I did a test, like on Boxing Day, I did a test. And that was it. And we were like, oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) But we're not married. And we were all these things that we needed to do. So, yeah, it happened really quick. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, we're so lucky. We're so lucky. But you just never know with these things how long it's going to take. And, you know, and so I... And that was my... Yeah, that was, sorry, that was my point to Ben. So I'll go back. Yeah. So Ben's two years younger than me. So he's kind of was in no rush. And I was like, we don't know how long this is going to take. And so when it happened that quickly, he was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, sorry. <laughs> Did you do the test together? Uh, yeah, like he was in bed and I was like, right, I need to do a test because I don't feel right. I did it in the bathroom and then I sort of came on to him and he was like, he was silent for about two hours. He didn't know what to say. He was stunned. Um, yeah, so we were like, yeah, we were together. Crazy, isn't it? It's, such, it's the best moment ever. It was amazing. Oh, and there's no no feeling like it. Do you know what I mean? I feel like when other people share their, like, their pregnant, I feel like there's that you get that glimmer of it. The same with being proposed, like the proposal stuff. I think it's a very unique yeah. feeling those things, and I, I don't, I don't think they come up. For me, they've not happened in any other part of my life. That feeling that comes up. That just it's is... funny. I was speaking to someone about this the other day about how having aura, as in giving birth, was the the ultimate for me. Like it makes yeah. me want to cry now. It was the ultimate, and I do feel like ever since having her. The things that are supposed to feel like, oh, I'm like, yes, nice. Because <laughs> that was my, that was it. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Which is why I can't really, with like, I'm in an iron at the moment, of, do we have another one? Like, if we're fortunate enough to be able to do that. And I just, I know everybody says, no, it does come again. But I'm like, I'll never have that feeling. I'll never have that love. I don't understand how I do it again. But I guess that's because all I've ever experienced is just me. Yeah. You know, my mum always says, I would never love them, love another child the way I loved you. That's why I didn't. So I guess that has sort of been, been ingrained in into me. Does Ben yeah, have yeah. siblings? Yeah, so he wants more. He's got a brother and a sister. Right. Isn't it funny, yeah. though, because that's what you set out to do. Like you said, saying earlier, you wanted a big family, whereas now you've got one, yeah. you're kind of like mirroring what your mum has said before. I know, and it's bad because I kind of have to start to... But also, you don't know the reality. You know, I don't know how you do it. I was like, yeah, I want three kids. And now I'm like, I'm just about managing with one. Like, I don't know how, I don't know how I do this again. All I can say is the chaos. You know know the chaos you said you were chasing earlier, that big family vibe? The chaos is real and you have to go at some point, go, I'm just going to embrace this chaos. Uh, So, I mean, it is, it's different vibes. Um, but I mean, yeah, I can remember being in uh, a lift somewhere with one with Buzz when he was when he was like ten months old, and someone got in and they said they randomly said something like that they'd had two, and she said your heart basically just grows. Your heart, it's like it doesn't overshadow the love for the first. It doesn't replace. Doesn't do anything else other than just like that love stays the same. And actually, when my kids are nice to each other that love for each of them kind of grows again. Like yeah. that, well, even from when they were like tiny and like, so your love is still evolving and deepening and stuff as time goes on. It's a really... As time goes on. Yeah. How was your pregnancy? Yeah. I mean, oh, I really, it's so funny because I just don't ever talk about this. So I'm more than happy to, but I never do. I really didn't enjoy being pregnant. Mm. Now, it was fine as in medically health wise I was so I was fine I was very lucky I felt sick obviously for the first I think five months but yeah. many people do and it was all I ever wanted but there was just something that I just didn't enjoy it and I don't know if it's because I was so worried but you know outwardly not worried and I mm. kept so much in 
a lot of it was to and it's so selfish and crazy now looking back but was to do with my body changing yeah I do you think as well you were very aware of that because of being on set because of having to hide bumps and signs of it that you, was that part yeah. of it I think so and also I was doing a miscarriage storyline oh for god's sake in the show that makes yeah. me want to cry that you'd have to be going yeah. through that at the same it was, time. It, I know, I know. And and it's hard because I don't want to I don't want to speak about it in a way that it comes with, you know, they were they were great with me. The mm. shit, it's not their fault. They no, no, no. the storyline started and then I got pregnant. Yeah, so it's yeah, not yeah. like they said, Oh, you're pregnant. Hey, we're gonna hit you with this storyline. It was just how it, it happened. But my character had multiple miscarriages whilst I was heavily pregnant you know like yeah. throughout my whole pregnancy obviously I was there till I was eight months pregnant so I think maybe subconsciously that is what affected me yeah like looking back I think it's probably something I should probably you know really look into but it must have been something to do with that because I was grieving yeah a you know a miscarriage on set and then in between and whilst my baby was it makes me feel sick baby was kicking yeah it was so 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 strange so I didn't really enjoy it but I don't know if it was that side of it or if it was just the or maybe both the body change yeah the cravings the things that I was like not in control I wasn't in control of what was happening Mm. and I do feel like if there is a next time I will be I will feel very differently towards it yeah. It was almost like as well, I didn't really know what was coming out the other end. You know, the moment she was there, I was like, what was <laughs> I thinking? What was I worried about? But yeah, it was a, it was a funny time. It was like I was I was like I was going through the motions but not really um like embracing what was happening. Do you think part of that as well is would people have been checking in on you at work and kind of going, are you okay to do this? And because you want to, I think a lot of women don't want to feel like they can't do something because they're pregnant. So I'm fine. I'm fine. So kind of doing it. 100%. 100%. Everybody was amazing. The directors, yeah. you know, my cast, obviously everybody was amazing. They are. It's a family there. Yeah. But, and even now I am a mum. Yep, it's fine. Yep, I can do it. Yep, I can drop her off and four minutes later be at this meeting. Well, no, I can't actually physically do that, but I have to say yes because, yeah. you know, if it's not me, it'll be someone else. Mm-hmm. Someone else will take that job. You know, it's, it's yeah, it's tough. It's hard. It's hard for any mum in any industry and in any, you know, it's not just within what we do. It There is a, something comes along and it is your whole world and your main priority, but you also have to be, or society tells you you have to also be this and yeah especially at work I couldn't say no I'm not going to do this I had a storyline that I had to complete before I left the show and I would never because of my professional head ever say otherwise yeah and I, I it was fine I'm not saying it shouldn't I shouldn't have done it because I did it you know I think I did it well and also I guess what was pushing me was the true stories that I was telling you know I was doing it for those women and I was so fortunate to be pregnant so I had to I had to do it for those people for those women you know it could have been me you just don't yeah I think it was a lot when I think that it was a heavy time well also for a lot of people first pregnancies that don't come after a loss there can be a lovely naivety that comes with that, you know, unless people have been, you know, sharing stories within that. But most people, unless they've had a miscarriage, it's only when you have a miscarriage that other people go, oh, I've had one. It's like a it, for me over the years, because I had a miscarriage before I had Buzz so 10 years ago. Right. It almost felt like, well, 11 years ago, it almost felt like a little secret. You know, people didn't talk about it. And I think it's becoming much more um, talked about now. But I think because of that sort of secrecy around it or that silence, it means that you're allowed in that first pregnancy to be naive to the dangers that can happen, to that those losses that can happen, the, the risks. Whereas for you, I feel like maybe doing the work that you were doing at that time, doing that storyline, it's like you had gone through those losses because... In, in a way, like you were, you were so much more open to other people's experiences and how pregnancies can end. 
Yeah, and also the a big part of the storyline, I should say, was that she had endometriosis. Right. So another part of the storyline was how difficult it could be to be to have a baby. Yeah. So I, I also felt so fortunate that I was, you know, healthy and, and pregnant. So yeah, that's a, I guess that's what I'm saying is there's probably so much more to it than how was your pregnancy? Yeah, not great. It was yeah. because there's so much going on. Yeah. Um and maybe and and as you said, like yeah, maybe because I was on screen and I was so aware of this big change happening to me, like physically. It's crazy, isn't it? And I look back now and I'm like, oh my god, look at that massive bump! It was amazing. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, oh, hide it, yeah. you know. Yeah. Can we put yeah, it behind yeah, a plant yeah. pot? What can, what can we hide it with? Well, I mean, towards the end, you could see it in my earlobe. Like, there was no <laughs> way. <I'm... laughs> there was no way. Because well, you're so it. petite as well, so I imagine you know. I ballooned like really. Was, I'll show you a photo after. I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how did you feel going towards the birth? Because were you like with work going on and those massive storylines? Did you have a lot of headspace to kind of go? Actually, how is this baby coming out of me? So I did a hypnobirthing course. It's mm. I, I'm your typical story. I did a hypnobirthing course and I was going to be in the water and there was going to be fairy lights and I was going to be playing my Jill Scott album and da, da 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 And so going in, I was actually really sort of confident. I wasn't yeah. afraid at all. I was sort of really... And even like I was at home, my waters didn't break. I ended up having an emergency cesarean. That's basically where I'm going with this yeah, story, yeah. like many of Got us that. do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 even at home you know like my like the contraction started and I was like this is it I was really excited I was really, really excited to sort of yeah to me I didn't know what I was having we didn't find out so I was really excited to see what I was what I what was did coming. you have any like I like because some people like I knew I was having a girl or and I feel like for some I people thought it was a boy <laughs> everybody told me I was having a boy yeah right. everybody told me I was having a boy we only really had boys names we didn't oh, really? really have any girls names I didn't name her for the first few days <laughs> it's always like well what are we gonna um so yes but long story short I just couldn't dilate right I only got to four centimeters okay. on day three <laughs> oh. yeah it was it was crazy um, anyway, I ended up having everything, epidural, da, 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 they broke my waters. And yeah, we had an emergency section in the end. And obviously, it, none, none of it matters because she's here, but it took me months to get over that I hadn't had the birth that I wanted. Really? Yeah, I, 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 it really affected me. It really affected me, which is silly, which is crazy. But I just had it in my head and in my heart that this is how I was going to do it. And it didn't go to plan. And I, it really affected me. Even looking at her, knowing, like, well, she's here. She's perfect. Nothing happened. Yeah, that really took a lot to get over. Do you think having a plan almost makes you feel like you failed because you didn't follow that plan? And had you not yeah, had that plan in some ways, you'd have been open to any I think so I do think it was helpful I'm I'm pleased I did it but I think that as you said because I then got so obsessed with how it was going to happen and also because my contractions even when they were like they were five minutes apart when I got to the hospital but because I was only two centimeters at that point I didn't really I don't I obviously didn't get to the point of the pain being so unbearable that you can't you know stand so in my head I, I I felt like I could have done it yeah it wasn't me that didn't allow it you know it wasn't that I said I can't do this so there was a big part of me that was like yeah but I could have done it if only I just dilated <laughs> but you know the truth is I would have died if this happened years ago because my <laughs> body just wasn't letting me do it so I you know and it is it is so strange I don't know why we all or like we just have it in our heads, even the way people phrase it, like, oh, did you give birth naturally? Mm. Or just the way people phrase it is so bad. Yeah. Because you're like, uh, well, no, but, you know. You know what? Some of the, the uh, best hypnobirthing practitioners that I know have had multiple children and had experiences where they've had to go for an emergency C-section and actually feel 
the the work that they did leading up to that and it's why they have become practitioners and kind of you know go down that path with other mums is so that a mum can feel empowered and calm no matter what happens but there is this yeah. big societal thing I'd like to think it's shifting but I mean you've just you're only two years in and you're still carrying like you you had that guilt of not doing it the way that you had set out to um yeah and it, it's really difficult isn't it to kind of go well because birth is such a thing it's such a I think people love knowing love hearing the birth stories you know or however that happened and and actually we do have to talk because there are so many people who have emergency C-sections or have elective C-sections and that's absolutely yeah. fine. That does not diminish you as a mum and the fact that you've grown a human and you have birthed a human. You've birthed a human in, in you know, you absolutely have. Yeah. yeah. There was just a, I don't even like, I hate to even say it out loud because I don't want to be judged, but I just, I just felt like, I don't know if I should say this. I'll say it and you can let me know if you want it, if I should use it or not. But I felt like as a woman, mm. it's something in life I wanted to experience. And I feel like that experience was taken away from me. Yeah, that makes sense. Even though she's here, like that's yeah. what it was. I was like, but I wanted to experience that. I wanted to know what it felt like to go full term, like labor. That's what I want. Yeah. But I don't know why, because there's nobody around me that's made me feel like that. Not my mom, not Ben, not my friends. So where did that? Where does that come from? It's strange. Yeah. It's strange. Yeah. Because why? Why do I? Why do I feel that way? You know, as I said, I could have died if that was many years ago. So I should just feel happy that she's it's here. It's very hard, <laughs> isn't it, when people, when those thoughts or those feelings are in your head. And in your being, and and people go, but she's here and she's healthy, so just be happy. Well, stuff in your head doesn't doesn't respond to that. It does, it doesn't, and you don't know how to control it. I guess. Yeah. But I have. I've dealt with it now. It was just. It was something that. Yeah, it took a while, and also because I was in a three day labour, I was exhausted. <laughs> so for months, and then I got COVID when she was two weeks old. It was like. <laughs> I think I was just so exhausted maybe for so long that it took me a while to sort of catch up with myself to be sane again. Yeah. How did that yeah. all affect your mental health? Because you have done an amazing campaign with NSPCC um, about perina perinatal health. And Isn't it incredible? Oh, honestly, watching it just... So you, you'd give us a brief outline of what the actual little film is because it's so beautiful so it was so it was brought to me it was it it was actually not to do with nspcc to start with it was brought to me um there was a campaign for another company I, I'm, I'm not probably allowed to say who or how it come about but people had written in letters um like to do with mental health as a whole yeah. and this letter came in and my friend who was working on the project said oh read this what do you think and it was from a a, a mum and I think her child at the time was eight but it was writing a letter probably a little bit like what you do at the end of this to herself yeah. as a mum when she first became a mum and I read it and I remember I was in the bar and I sobbed because I was like this is it this is it this is how we feel and it's all about so the film that I did it's a short film and it's it's one woman's story one woman's letter about being lonely mm. in a world where even if you're surrounded by people you just feel lonely and we are in a world now where people don't necessarily speak a lot of things are done via the phone or whatsapp or instagram or there's so many ways that we're in con we're connected to each other now but there's no actual real human connection yeah. and how having a yeah, and, and having a child, a baby in that time, you sort of put on this act, like, you you know, you want people to think that everything's fine, but inside you're lost. And that's sort of what the short is. Anyway, NSPCC picked it up because they're doing a campaign for, you know, mental health within new parents, male and female. But it is, it's, it's amazing. It's, I'm so proud of it because it's, I've had so many women message me saying, you know, thank you. I mean, I'm I'm only acting, but for sort of telling our story. But I felt the same. I felt the same. I could have friends over or Ben would be sat next to me on the sofa and you just feel like 
no one understands how you feel, how you could possibly be feeling. Like I was the happiest I've ever been in my life, but at the same time, I was so out of depth, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, and you feel like certain thoughts that go through your head, you can't say to anybody. You know, I remember being at the, I know so many people now, because I've spoken about it. I remember standing at the top of the stairs, just thinking, I'm going to drop it. Like, we're going to fall down the stairs. But don't ever say that out loud because people think it's, but that's, yeah. these things are so normal. Yeah. These things are so normal. Just, just imagining the worst all the mm-hmm. time. Um, and just feeling like, you know, or like, you know, you're on your third night feed or they've been up for eight hours of the whole night and you're so exhausted and you just think, I just don't know how I'm going to get through tomorrow. But you mustn't say anything. But you can, because we've all had these thoughts, or most people have had these thoughts or feelings, because you're exhausted, and it's a form of torture. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Sleep deprivation is a form of torture, you know. So it does crazy things to your mind. So that's basically what the whole campaign is, is just about speaking, speaking out, speaking to somebody. And if you don't have anybody necessarily to speak to, you can obviously call their their helpline, which is amazing. And your girlfriends, have are there... There are more babies within that. So how has that changed your friendship group, you know, having the babies and the toddlers involved? <laughs> you just don't have time. We could meet up all day and by the end of the day be like, I hope you're okay because I don't know a single thing about you or your life. It's all about nappies and bottle feeding times and nap times. And, yeah, it, of course, it, it changes so much doesn't it yeah we try to a lot of my friends we are we all went to school together but we're sort of in separate pockets now um we try to sort of do stuff as and when we can away from the kids but not nowhere near as often as we used to we were all on holidays and you know there was there was so much even yeah like Alex Merritt you know you know all of my friends you know there's so many kids between us all now it's not the same, but then what is so amazing is when we do get together with our kids and they're all sat together, you're like, wow, this is so special. You know, when you've got such a special friendship and then your friends could potentially become friends, like that's something else, right? But of course, all I want to do is go on a girl's holiday right now <laughs> and talk about other things. <laughs> but is it, I find it fascinating how so often, though, that will always come back to the kids. And I leave, like, I, like my best mates, when I see them, I leave and I'm like, oh, we didn't finish that conversation. And, oh, my God, I hope that they didn't, because I didn't give them that, like, the end bit of that. I hope they don't think that because I've left it there, you know. Yeah. You just yeah, start yeah, overthinking yeah. things. Does it get easier when your kids get older, though? Because do you feel like you can sort of meet up and they can do their own thing, so you're, or not really? Well, at times, like, Cara came over last weekend and we had a big old sleepover with her too. Um, oh, and I, lovely. It was really, really lovely. And I think um, there's a weird level of calm, even though, like, so I've got three. So add two more kids into the mix. Weirdly, people, like, they all start playing together and it's calmer than when it's just my three, in a way. Yeah, OK. But the flip side of that is there's still different meltdowns happening from different, you know, there's still different pushbacks. And so it did like you get time time. to actually catch up, I guess, when they went to bed? We did. But because it was Strictly night, we stayed up, we'd watched Strictly, we'd had like a little dance competi- competition afterwards. So I think it was about 10 o'clock before um, all the kids were actually asleep because it was wow. a weekend. And we both just went to bed. We're like, we'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, exhausted. Yeah. Oh, can I come next time? Let me come. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The kids it's are quite judgy. I haven't seen... <laughs> when it comes to their dancing competitions, seen... they're quite judgy. Right, well, it's always yeah. only two, so she'll just be sat there clapping, <laughs> so that'll be fine. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. Like, even seeing, you know, the last few times I've seen Cara, yeah, we've had the kids. Like, it's... Yeah. And I just think, oh, maybe when Aura's a bit older, it'll be easier. Because obviously, you know, up until now, it's been, don't touch that, don't do that. She can't get that. that, that. Whereas now she's sort of very steady, obviously, and able. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is, yeah, it is easier because a lot of my friends have kids of a similar age. Like we've yeah. sort of had kids within the, a few years. So one can look after the other or, you know, she can take that out of her mouth. But, you know, we've we've kind of got that. Yeah, it is. It's just different. It's just everything's different. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, Everything's different. 
soon enough it'll be just us again <laughs> you know but yeah, that, even yeah. that's interesting like seeing how your friends kids like how everyone grows up and at some point you know someone's going to be a teenager and they're going to be sat with you at the table you know whereas they'd all be off playing suddenly they're with you then we'll have the teenage years where they're absolutely with us and then they're going off out on their own like there's so many different things I think ahead aspects yeah how old is Buzz now nine yeah mine are nine seven and five yeah wow that's flowing it really has it's really scary yeah. like yeah. he's he's yeah. he's up to below my chin now which wow. feels really really weird yeah buddy keeps yeah. telling me he's up to my boob which you know <laughs> he yeah, really lovely, yeah. <laughs> don't tell your friends at the school yeah yeah <laughs> Oh. yeah um but yeah it does it just it does just sort of fly by and I think um I, I think what's really important is that when you have friends and you've got kids I think it's so important yes your kids are going to have meltdowns they might cry you might cry but you carry on get having those get-togethers no matter how messy it is because it might be your child having the meltdowns one day, but it'll be someone else's next time. And yeah, it seems so important to lean on those people who do get you. They understand you completely. And that's what we are so lucky to have with all of my friends, even my yeah. friends that are not from school. You know, I'm speaking as if all my friends are from school. They're not. There's no judgment. You just yeah. don't, you just, yeah, you know, I guess I'm one of the last, I'd say, to have to start having babies. So I've sort of witnessed it all. So I, yeah. for me, I don't feel that way because if anything, I go, help me. <laughs> have her. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? You know, um, but I am lucky. Yeah, there's no judgment at all within my friendship group. And it's it's about leaning on each other and asking for advice that like you just have to ask. Yeah. Because, and it doesn't, you know, one friend's advice might may not work. Um, but you're all winging it. That's what you have to remember. Well, I wonder and, you know, where it comes from, where we have we have that feeling of having to have all the answers when we can't possibly have all the answers. Like, the, the answers are always changing to every question, I feel like. You know, it's never... Yeah. What works one day might not work next. But I feel like... I don't, it's so weird, isn't it? I don't know whether it's because we sometimes feel like our mums might have had all the answers or our parents or other people might have all the answers, but... Really, we are just winging it, and it, and we have to let go of all that noise that clouds. I think it what up. it comes from is the fear of your. You know, I'm now sort of getting to the point of, okay, I'm not just looking after a baby. I'm creating a human, a person, and it's yeah. that thing of, am I doing this right for her sake, not for my sake? But am I doing? Should I be teaching her that? Should how do I, you know, go about? You know, she, as I said, we were, well, I didn't tell you, I was telling someone else, we were painting a pumpkin this morning because she's not interested in carving out a pumpkin. Obviously, she too, she has no idea what Halloween is. But Ben bought us a pumpkin yesterday as something nice to do for each, with each other because I'm not going to be here for Halloween. And I'm upset about it and she has no idea what's going on. <laughs> anyway, we're painting this pumpkin and she wanted to like dip the thing back in. And I said, no, darling. And she threw the paintbrush at my face. And I was like, ah, what do I do now? So she's two. Does she know what she's done is wrong? So I was like, please, can you say sorry? Like, I'm trying to do the whole, like, gentle parenting approach. She just literally looked at me like this and just carried on. And I thought, I don't know. And so I'm at an estate now where I don't know what to do. I don't know how to parent a two-year-old because I've never done it before. Yeah. You know, every day is a first. That's what I'm getting at is every day is a first. So, But now what's scary is it's not about... Am I giving her enough formula? It's how do I teach her to be kind and not throw the paintbrush in my face? Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> in so some ways, though, when on. you get to these bits, those things that caused you so much anguish when they were newborns seem so simple. Even though I know yeah. that the newborn stage, I literally like in the first three weeks of having a newborn to hell like and I and I said that so early on and I kind of stick by that even though it makes me feel guilty uh towards those kids who are older now but if yeah. I look back compared to some of the things that we need to face now I'm like ah, oh, you know now you've got someone who doesn't comply if you want to use that word or doesn't you know you have to really you know try and work your way Big through <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, like I said, I cried last weekend because no one was blooming listening. My kids don't listen to me now. You know, it's this weird shift but in what dynamic. Do you do? What do you do? What do, I don't I don't know what to do. Well, no, I don't. To be honest, sometimes I just the have to turn to was Tom. The day I ignored it. Yeah. I went on for about 10 minutes about why you should say sorry. Please say sorry to mum. She knows what I'm saying. She understands every single word I say yeah. and she knows how to say sorry. Yeah. She, did she say sorry? No, she carried on painting. Then I thought, do I take the paints off her? But should I be doing that? She's only two. She's not fat. Anyway, in the end, I just got I got another paintbrush out and I carried on painting. I ignored it. <laughs> and I was like, I just don't know what to do. I need to like read a book on this part because I'm no, I'm not ready for this. But I think it's the this. same thing. Like, so if I look back to having a newborn and I'm like, I read all the books before Buzz arrived and he hadn't read a single one. And actually it turns out that every baby is different. And the important thing is that you tune in to your baby. I think toddlers and children are different. Like I have to look at all three of my kids and I know that when certain things happen, I have to deal with it in a different way to each of them because different things right. work. You know, where I can be firm right. with one, the firmer approach with another simply will not work. It's like two bits of a magnet that will just like bash against each other. How just... interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it is that kind of so therefore you always feel like I don't uh, what do I do? And and there's definitely a thing at the moment where there's no listening happening and um and I do the feeble thing sometimes of going Tom, you know, he's not li- yeah. like I'm telling dad on the situation. Yeah, yeah. You know, do they do they have do they sort of listen to mum or dad? Want to like is, is it all? I can tell myself sometimes that they simply don't listen to me, uh, okay. and therefore it's quite a relief when I realise. Oh no, they're also not listening to Tom. That makes me feel better. I mean, obviously you've still got a child okay, who isn't yeah, listening, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's just nice to know that it's not just me. You know, just you, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm learning every day. It's you know. We are. We have to. Yeah. And then, and the only other, the best bit of advice I was ever given was have like three people that you go to, and that is it. So from the moment she was born, someone said to me, it was actually it was actually a director at work when I was pregnant. Said just have your key three people and nobody else because otherwise you'll be so confused with all the advice. So still to this day, I have three people that if something happens, like the paint situation, yeah. I will ask them. And now you know you're my fourth. Actually, <laughs> I might add you into the mix because you've got three and they're older. <laughs> um, yeah, just otherwise you can get like inundated yeah. with advice and it's too much. And I was the same as you. I read every book and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's but yeah, hard. you learn as you go, I guess. You do, you do, and it's that weird and now thing, I'm isn't it? Terrible too. <laughs> oh mate, do you know what? Yeah, and then they become a three major, like so. It's never, but you know, sometimes it's amazing, and I think that you know, you just have to take the rough with the smooth, and you know, every day's a mixed bag. Yeah, of course. Louisa, if you were to write a letter on motherhood. Who would it be to and what would you say? I would probably write a letter to my mum. Mm. Um, makes, makes me feel quite emotional. I think, as I said, because I'm an only child growing up, like my mum and dad are still together, but my I was my mum's whole world. Now it's all right. She's not got no interest <laughs> in me at all now. Um, so we had, you know, we had such a strong bond. But then I got to an age where I was a teenager and we just did not get on. Like, it was just hellish for both of us. But now looking, so my letter would just be like, I understand it now. Like, Mm. that overwhelming feeling of love and worry and care. And I get it now. That's why she used to, in my words, drive me mad. Because you just can't, you can't describe that. Yeah feeling right and the worry and the concern and so I think it would just be to her to say you know I I understand it now and thank you because she is my rock now I am her mum yeah you know I get it now I get why she did half of what she did nothing was bad it's because it becomes your whole world has has, how has having a baby changed your relationship with your mum Oh, like beyond we were always close yeah. we were just we just had our times we had our times but now yeah it's changed it drastically well I'd say now we're closer than ever does that give you um 
like peace of mind or hope, I guess, for when Aura is older, like realizing that because people always like our oh, girls when they're teenagers or whatever. Does that kind of make you go, it's it will be fine? Like there might be some pushback, but actually, you came back, and so will she. Yeah, I think so because I have experienced it, so I know that feeling of I know how I felt with my mum was that I wanted to be my own person and break free and have my own, you know. But now looking back, I'm like, well, I was 15. Where did I think I was going? At, <laughs> you know, 11 o'clock at night. Um, and yeah, I guess it is the same. So it's just knowing the boundaries of make, making them feel independent, but also still having uh, boundaries, I guess, in place. Yeah. So I, I hope that what I've learned is, yeah, how to deal with her when she's a teenager. In short is what I'm saying. <laughs> And if not, my mum can have her because <laughs> she's done it yeah, before. It she's be fine. A, she's done. She's done it before. It would put it would be a letter to my mum to sort of say thank you, sorry, and I understand now. Um. So we finish the podcast with you completing three sentences. First sentence is being a mum means. Oh, you're gonna make me cry, aren't you? Um, everything and more. The next one is since having a child, I. Oh, yeah, have put life into perspective. <laughs> and I'm happy when. At the moment, when I'm at home with Aura, I'm happy when. I'm happy when. I just have put her to bed at the end of the day and I feel like I've got through another day. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Is that, Louis, is that... a, thank you. I know I know that touring is so difficult and I can remember being on week five or six of the last tour that I did and just feeling like, what on earth am I doing? And Tom texted me that night and just said, look, in six weeks' time or five weeks' time, whatever it was, you're going to be at home, you're going to be doing the bedtime routine and all of that time would have vanished. So make sure you're making the most of it while you're doing it. So just, that's the only advice I can give you right now. So make true. the most of it. Because, you know, by Christmas you're going to be home and, you know, on this I whole know. new chapter. So just embrace it. And read this book. I need to open <laughs> this book. That's what I need to do. When you I'm find yourself waking up at six o'clock train. in the morning, just start yeah. reading. There we go. It's so, 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 so true. Because I already know, come December, I'll be back home thinking, oh, I've not got a job, what am I going to do? Yeah. I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And I this know. is filling your cup in a different way. You know, this is this is you yeah. doing what you love. Um, you know, yeah, just, it's just letting go of the guilt and yeah. remembering that you're a person, you were a person before, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, then, Thank you so much. This has been delightful. So Thank you so much for finally having me. Yay! And I'll Thank see you. you on Wednesday. I'll see you Wednesday, yeah. Okay, I can't wait. <laughs>